On my watch? I've got this watch, right? Here. Okay, good. I always have to have it on the podium because I can't. I, I'm not coordinated enough to look at my watch. I get off. I might not take the same time. Yeah. Where's Go Paul? Is he here? Yeah, he's right here. Oh, I didn't see him. Hey, are you leaving or are you staying? Zero, zero, zero. I wasn't expecting you to slip in. Let me stay in the I didn't get writing. It's all right. It's all right. I didn't know he was here. I didn't know he was here. Well, I think I gotta, every Sean's going to use them. Uh, uh, so there's just four of them. If you want, or you know, push them to the side. Or push them to the side. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you put it over towards the... I can't believe they didn't tell me. Can you just go over? I can't believe it. When I came out, I said, can I call John? And, and I said, I said, you know, Vicky, I just called the White House. Chris apparently is not coming. She, she just left. I said, what do you mean you just left? Do you want me anything? So anyway, let me do this. It's all right. I'm on. The hard part. Now we're in the loose part. Did you see the picture you guys All right, I think we're about to get started here, and I want to thank you all for, for being here. Um, certainly the opening panel with the uh, DHS secretary and the other distinguished guests from, um, from DOD and the White House and uh, DHS, a great way to kick this off. We've got about an hour here uh, now this afternoon uh, with a very distinguished panel of experts from both the federal government from state government and from the private sector, who are going to talk about some of the issues that uh, were discussed earlier this morning, uh, and and also we'll give everybody in the in the audience an opportunity to ask some questions. My name is Sean Henry. I'm assistant director with the FBI. I run uh, the FBI cyber program. All of our investigations worldwide um, related primarily to computer intrusions into networks, which is uh, one of the primary uh, uh, issues we're going to be addressing during National Cybersecurity Awareness Month and we'll be talking about today. What I'd like to do is, uh, is start with our panel and have each of them introduce themselves just for a minute or two and perhaps talk about uh, some of their issues or concerns and how they're operating now in their current capacity in, in cybersecurity. And then I'm going to talk uh, just for, for a couple of minutes to kind of frame the threat and then we'll go into some questions that I've got for the panel, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So why don't we start with our, our panel of experts uh, first. Hi, I'm Rowan Trollope, uh, Senior Vice President of Consumer Products at Symantec Corporation. I'm responsible for building and running the, the consumer business, which is uh, responsible for protecting around 50 million uh, consumer PCs around the world. Uh, I got my start in the industry when I was 16 right here in DC when the very first virus ever came out and uh, I was running around the world cleaning it up when I was in high school. <laughs> and uh, things have changed pretty dramatically since then. I'm still doing basically the same thing, but the bad guys look a lot different. And uh, you know, that's a, that, that makes my life very, very interesting, frankly, and uh, makes it a lot more important 
Uh, and uh, so I think that is, uh, changes our focus at Symantec away from sort of going after hackers and kids and teenagers at home towards working with uh, folks like Sean at the FBI and the various uh, different agencies uh, to, to actually help and assist with providing information on tracking these guys down and, and putting them away. So that's a uh, big shift for us at Symantec and makes me very excited to be here today with my distinguished guests. So thanks for inviting me. Excellent, thanks Rowan. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I'm Michael Kaiser, the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. I think uh, you got a good flavor for what we're interested in earlier today. I'll just say that you know, our, our view of the world is um, really uh, just a broad base of users across a lot of different arenas, whether it's home users, younger kids, colleges and higher education, and small and medium-sized enterprises. So really, actually, when you add those all up, it's a pretty big chunk of the pie, and our efforts are our awareness. It's making people smarter. It's making people um, really embrace the digital culture safely and securely. Excellent. My name is Gopal, Gopal Khanna. I'm the CIO for the state of Minnesota, and I'm really pleased to be here today in my capacity as the president of the National Association of State CIOs, NASIO. It's a body of, uh, of a collective body of all the state CIOs, and the way we see ourselves when it comes to cybersecurity is we are the first defenders, first responders, should there be a cybersecurity attack. Because very often what is lost in this whole conversation about cybersecurity is that it really is not as a federal threat only, it's a national threat. And as the speakers pointed out this morning, actually it has international element to it as well. And we are very concerned in state and local government because should there be a cyber attack, the citizens will be impacted in Virginia, Maryland, Wyoming, Montana, God forbid, Minnesota, and other places. And we <laughs> have to be the first responders and first uh, from, from every aspect of government services. So while we need to work with the private sector and all elements of government, we, we want to be sure that it is seen as a national issue, a national threat. And I'm really pleased to be here today. It's a very interesting panel to talk about the future. And we certainly can do a lot to make our uh, digital future very secure. Morning, everyone. I'm uh, Phil Reidinger. I think you all heard me talk at least a little bit at the last time. Uh, I guess the one thing I'd say um, in addition, particularly around the topic of awareness, is that we're, I think, at a moment of challenge and opportunity right now, um, more generally around cybersecurity, but specifically also around awareness. Um, challenge because I think, as we all know, the threats have grown much more significant. Make no mistake about it. I consider that undeniable. We can have a colloquy about that if you like. Uh, in addition, we've got a populace that, for the most part, did not grow up with cybersecurity as a part of their DNA. Um, and we talked a little bit before the, the DEPSEC um, death, talked a little bit about how we're in 1928. You, know, you can think about the same thing with regard to the automobile. So we've got a bunch of people driving cars who didn't grow up watching their parents drive cars. You know, when I drive a car right now, as I'm pulling up to a red light, I often hear one of my sons say from the back, red light, daddy, stop. He knows how to drive, essentially, not how to steer the car, but what the rules of the road are. Um, most of us didn't grow up that way. Um, our kids will, but we've got to get through that bump with you know, a populace you know, where senior citizens are, for example, the widest growing demographic in the use of the internet. Um, that's the challenge part. The opportunity is all of you. It's not us. We don't matter that much. It's all of you. you know, I, if I wasn't clear from what I said before, you know, I look out at all of you and I am inspired. I really am, because the, the collection of commitment across the public and private sector, you know, all of the different private companies I see out there, all of the different government agencies, you know, from the FBI to the White House um, to DHS, you know, lots of different ones. I could, I could point around you to state governments. It's just, it's a huge collection of people. And so that, you know, that emphasizes that we really do need to execute on our shared responsibility and all take not only corporate but personal responsibility to raise awareness. You know, on the break I learned that Shannon is doing his job by tweeting about our activity while we're here. Now, you can make a joke about that. I just did. But it's actually true. I mean, that's a great thing. Thank you, Shannon. I want everybody to go out there and use the opportunities of the next month 
to raise awareness. That's what this is all about. You know, as, as, as I think you know, it was said before, this is really almost a recommitment. You know, it's a liturgy that we engage in on a yearly basis that is, is, it is essential to what we do. You know, we get together again and we say, here's what we're going to do this year. We're going to make sure that we get to that ecosystem next place where we need to be. And so I, I'd say thank you all for being here. Um, you are clearly a huge part of the solution, and I, I value your commitment. Thanks, Phil. Um, I, I just want to take a minute to, before we go into some questions just to kind of frame the scene for all of us. When we talk about National Cybersecurity Awareness Month and the Secretary stood up and talked about protecting your computer from, from virus, making sure that your firewall is in place, et cetera, um, I, I think that most of the people here do have a good understanding about what the threat is. Uh, but I think that one of the reasons we have a problem, and Phil started to go down this road, uh, is that the, the average American does not understand what the threat is. If we were to say that there was a bomb planted right in the middle of this room, everybody would scatter because we all know what it looks like when a bomb goes off. We know what it looks like when a plane fly, uh, flies into the side of a building because we've all seen that. But I think most people don't understand what the results are, what the consequences are of a cyber attack. They don't understand what the loss of data means to them. They don't understand what the denial of access to those networks means to the running of the country, to the national economic infrastructure. I don't think that they actually understand that. And I think that it's important for all of us to recognize that the threats that we face from organized crime groups, from terrorist organizations who are trying to access our networks every single day to have the same impact on this nation as they had by flying planes into buildings eight years ago, that the threat from foreign intelligence services who are conducting electronic espionage every single day, trying to get into the networks of every single agency inside this city, every clear defense contractor throughout this country, every educational university spread out throughout this nation, um, that, that the threats are so great, that the consequences are so significant, the threat to our national security, the next threat to our economic security is so strong that it's the requirement of everybody in the private sector to take their own personal independent uh, opportunity to help to secure themselves and our nation. So I, I appreciate those comments. Um, uh, let me ask a, a question, if I could. I'll, I'll ask uh, the question to Phil first. We've got uh, private sector uh, representation here and, and, and state uh, um, representation. I'm interested in, if you could, just describe from a U.S. government perspective what the role of DHS is here and how DHS can help to better support this overall program that we're, that we're talking about from a cybersecurity perspective. In, in comparison to some of the other partners we have on stage. So with, with regard to awareness specifically, we have, we have a broad set of responsibilities with regard to the private sector. You know, working together to share information, helping to drive policy in a way that uh, secures networks better, um, gathering technology from the private sector so we can do a better job of protecting government networks and helping inform the private sector about what the threat is. Um, in terms of awareness, that last piece starts to get us into that. Um, you know, we have access to information and capabilities that we need to use in partnership with the private sector. Um, we need to, to share that the threat is as significant as it is and be a part of a coalition with the private sector in terms of advising individuals, businesses about the things that they need to do. So, it, We've got, as the secretary said, we've got tips pages at, you know, at dhs.cyber or dhswaxcyber and at, uh, and at uscert.gov. NCSA's got tips. FBI's got tips. You know, this is one area where that's great. Um, you know, as many tips and as much reach as we can get out there, that's excellent. So we need to work with our, our partners on that. We need to work with our partners in law enforcement um, because law enforcement can be an essential part of raising awareness. We most particularly need to work with our partners in the state and local governments because it, they're the pointy end of the spear when it comes to government activity. Uh, it, if there were uh, compromises to a government system, it, it could happen to a lot of federal systems and the effect would be remote for a person. It could be significant nationally but remote to a person. You know, effects on state and local governments are very direct and very immediate for people. And uh, the, 
The state and local governments have a close touch, so we need to work in very close partnership with the MSISAC and NACIO and individual states and localities to make sure that we're all getting the word out um, about um, not only the seriousness of the threat, but the fairly simple steps that people can take to help secure their systems and their lives and families from the threats that are out there. So I'd ask the, the other panelists then, from your unique perspective, the steps that you're taking in your capability within your constituency, your agency, or within your area of responsibility to make sure that people are more aware, uh, digitally aware, uh, and, and, and um, ha have visibility on the threat and the, the uh, opportunities they have to mediate those threats. Well, from state's perspective, what we are working uh, on with the, at the National Association of State CIOs, NASIO Group, for the last uh, five, seven, seven years on, on cybersecurity front is three areas. One is awareness, and we've been working on that awareness because it is very difficult for our um, legislators to understand the significance and the impact uh, of, uh, of cybersecurity. It's, it's, uh, it's an uh, invisible infrastructure. They don't see it. They cannot touch it. They cannot feel it. It's not sexy to invest in something that they cannot cut ribbons. I'm going to be very blunt and honest about it. Um, <laughs> and the second challenge is that while we are facing the threats, we have to be reactive. And, and that's where we lot the work of, uh, uh, that has taken place at DHS and, and our workings with MSI, SAC, and others to, to be reactive, to understand how we can quickly respond to attacks. And the third is equally important, which is being proactive. So as state CIOs, what we have to make sure is that as we make major investments in government's um, IT portfolio, we got to take a different approach. And that's where I think this panel's focus as uh, talking about the future of our, dig our digital future, that's where the key is going to be, because there's no way in the world we can transform all our IT assets in the country. It'll be just a, it's just an impossible task. So what we really have to do is reimagine and revisit what our future would look like. And that's where taking a different approach to architecture is going to be the key to our success. We at NASIO have approached OMB and the federal CIO and have started a conversation about thinking about secure government architectural framework. The FEA model, the federal enterprise architecture, served the country well serve the government extremely well. But going forward, I think so we need to rethink an architecture design of our systems which embeds and bakes security in it. And, and there's enormous amount of work to be done because in government and state government, our challenge is to, to serve the citizens who are anxious to be served in real time, wherever they are, literally at the click of the button. And our systems were designed in the 50s to serve the citizens across the window in line, not online. So massive transformation has to happen. It will require massive in infusion of capital, which is very difficult to uh, explain to the legislature. And we have a lot of barriers, because even our government funding that comes, it perpetuates the silos. So there are things that can be done to break that cycle. And if you don't break that cycle, just awareness alone is not going to cut at the state and local level. Right. So from, from a, a private sector perspective, from the, the private corporation perspective, from the, the organizational perspective, public service organization, uh, we talked earlier about 85% of the infrastructure being owned by the private sector. What do you see as the role of each of your organizations in terms of the awareness to the, to the general public? So we have uh, sort of two primary jobs at, uh, at Symantec. Uh, one is helping to protect protect critical infrastructure and providing our technologies to protect the systems to businesses and to government, state, local, federal. Uh, and we do that around the world. And then the second part of our business is protecting consumers. And that's where I'm really focused. Uh, so our role, and, and we've seen a shift over the last four years, we've seen number one, an increase uh, by 600% in the number of threats over the last four years. And Specifically, in the last couple of years, the bad guys have realized that it's not systems that are the weakest link anymore, but it's people. And you can't install code on an individual. Uh, you have to educate them. And I'll tell you a story. I was at home the other day, and my brother's uh, staying with me in the, guest in the guest room. 
I was making my coffee in the morning and I overheard snippets of his conversation. So he was on the phone with his bank and he was frustrated because it sounded to me like uh, his uh, account was overdrawn and I wandered into his, his room and I was peeking over his shoulder. <laughs> and he has an email on his computer that says, your account has become overdrawn. And he's on the phone and of course this was a phishing he was attack. with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, it's, he's got a phishing email. And I say, good Lord. So I, you know, in slow motion, I'm jumping and knocking the phone out of his hand. But in reality, you know, I uh, said, Josh, hang up the phone. This is not a real situation. And then I explained it to him. But the weak link there was my brother who was, you know, look, he's a chef. You know, so if those guys get me, shame on me. If they catch my brother and, you know, drain his account, which would have happened in this call because it was two steps away from, sure, we can help you out. Provide me with your account information. We'll take care of you. And we see these stories over and over and over again, protecting uh, the millions of consumers that we protect. We have a big responsibility to educate. So this year, we've launched a major new campaign to educate consumers. And, and that is the primary thrust of our activity this year. So we're reaching out directly to, the, to our consumers through our products. So literally on the desktop, we've, uh, we've hired um, expert, uh, you know, expert writers, and we're providing content, educational content, directly through the products. Uh, and then we are also launching a campaign, and you, you, will, you may see it, uh, and we'll actually be here in D.C. on the 28th with a, a physical embodiment of the black market where, uh, where your information is bought and sold online, and we're mocking that up so that you can touch it and feel it and see it, and that is designed to get out to, you know, through the media to consumers around the world and really get them to be aware of the threat. And so I think that's really the biggest thing that we can do right now as an industry is educate our consumers uh, while we continue to provide protection for systems. Good. And I think our role um, falls sort of in between all of these in some kind of I interesting way. I think the things that we're really interested in, we think um, are that as the, as, as the players, and I'm not talking about NCSA as a player per se, but all of us as players in the, in the consumer and education of all the users in this country, that actually we got to sync up our messaging a little yes. bit that we need to work together. I think that we have to trust that consumers are going to make decisions about where they think the best information is, and it's hard for us to tell them otherwise, right? If they want to go over to DHS because that's where they're hearing today, for example, they heard the secretary speak on a news uh, feed, and they say, well, that's the place where the information is, they should go there. If they think it's over at Symantec or over at Microsoft or over at McAfee or any one of these companies where the information is, they should go there. Our hope is that we build a big tent and we all talk about what those messages are. We don't want people to be confused. You know, we, I think the traffic analogy is a great one. You know, we have the right of way. People know when they get to a corner that they need to look right first, right? No one's promoting left of way, right? And that we have to make sure that in this digital age, we are synced up in that way. And, we, and that's the role of NCSA, to further that discussion, to bring people together, to work on some of the messaging together, to find if there is some universal messaging around some of these things, and to push that forward out so that we can have the kind of public safety campaign that I think people envision. You know, the kind of, you know, I mean, we all probably remember Smokey the Bear. You know, I don't know what that would be now. But we need to do that work as a country, as a society, to get that messaging. And we've done so much great stuff in public health. I mean, I think the H1N1 is a perfect example. I think the country is ready to accept safety and security messaging. I think that's the consumers are ready. We have a culture of that now, and we need to sync it up and make it happen, and that's our job. Uh, that's, that's a good point, but uh, you talk about culture, and uh, I'll go back to something that Phil said. He, he talked about his son in the back seat of the car. I heard somebody in my office actually last week talking about digital natives versus digital immigrants. And I'd venture to say that most of the people here in this room are digital immigrants. Unlike our, our kids, I've got a couple of teenage girls who are certainly digital natives. And the challenges that we face with this generation now, some of the things that I'm seeing in, in my conversations with CIOs and CISOs um, are, are the use of social networking sites by employees and the vulnerabilities that we all know are inherent in those types of communication uh, mechanisms the use of peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. in uh, agencies where peer-to-peer -peer is being put on to corporate networks or government networks because the current generation uses peer-to-peer. -peer. And what are the challenges twofold from a, from a, a security perspective, per, perhaps Gopal or, or, or Phil might talk about that from a security perspective, but also from an educational perspective, how do we tell people that what it's okay for them to do still has a, a threat or a risk associated with it? 
Well, let me, let me start. I, I want to think a little bit more about the second piece. But let me start with the notion. I, 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 I'm a little hesitant that anyone says, well, we have to worry about peer-to-peer. Because peer-to-peer is great. It's actually unauthorized peer-to-peer -peer software that we need to worry about. In fact, we all use peer-to-peer -peer software every day. When you, when you IM, you're using peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, the, the challenge is, is, is not the technology. It's the instantiation of the technology, which might be um, unauthorized software, and how we use that technology. So even if it's authorized, it's as you suggested, Sean, you know, People using social networking you know, to, you know, maybe from their work computer, whether it's authorized or not, you're just going on a social networking site where they're not installing any software, but they're sharing things and they're more open about um, what they do than you know, people of perhaps my generation might be. You know, people of my generation typically did not post pictures of themselves in an intoxicated form publicly. Uh, so there's both those pieces. I mean, the first piece is really a challenge of policy you know, and technology. It's, it's how you control what's on your systems. It's not that different than wanting to control malware. You just want to make sure, you know, from a security perspective, you know, on your networks, you're running the software you want to run. And then, of course, we need to do a better job as the question, the gentleman in the very back, the question is for, about helping people understand what's good software and what's not good software. Got to do that piece. Um, the latter piece is really a part of awareness. And we can't pretend as we move forward on awareness that we're going to bend the culture to our will. So, you know, those of us who are baby boomers, you know, at the tail end of the baby boomer generation, <laughs> um, those of us who are boomers, you know, we're not going to talk to the Gen Xers and Gen Yers to thinking that perhaps privacy, ought, you know, in certain ways ought to be more important to them. We're going to have to figure out how to ensure that we've got a culture that provides security, you know, in line with more of their expectations about privacy. And then maybe they're going to have to tweak around the edges in terms of, at least with regard to sensitive information, you know, building into the culture some sensitivities about it. You know, you know, if you're on a social networking site, maybe it's OK to put your birthday because you want people to see your birthdays, but you don't put your birth year. You know, or just you know, obfuscating information in a way that meets their needs, but doesn't expose them to the same degree of threat. Good. The challenge at the state and local level, uh, the way I see it is, again, aging of the population and the, and the workforce, particularly in government. And at the same time, you've got, if you look at the demographic changes anywhere in the country, um, uh, you're seeing the emergence and, and greater population shifts towards Gen X, Gen Y, and millennials who are very proficient. So it comes back to to coming up with what Michael was suggesting, a coherent message that gets across. Our challenge is going to be to make sure that various segments get it. And the, the policy makers are the baby boomers, bulk of them. Uh, talking about Minnesota legislature, about 20% are Gen X, Gen Y. But the message has to be such that they all get the importance and significance of it. So as we broaden the scope of this Awareness Month and Awareness Program, which has come, by the way, a long ways, and this is just heartening to see how significant it is today. And, and, um, and I'm sure my colleagues all across the country would be very happy to see this participation. But we have got to take this thing really fast because uh, we are fighting against people who are attacking us every day, and we cannot build the awareness fast enough. And I don't think there's one single silver bullet solution to the messaging and awareness campaign either. We'll have to take it from the classroom to, to, to the baby boomers and to the farms as well. Good. Yeah, I think we, we approach this from several different angles. I think um, I'll start with the classroom piece because I think that's really important. I mean, we have a, about five states now that have uh, passed um, a requirement that uh, schools teach internet safety. But that's actually only a piece of the pie. Right? Safety is a very small piece of what we're talking about here. I think in the 60-day review, the president talked about digital safety, digital security, and digital ethics, which is a lot of the same kind of framework that we've been using for a comprehensive approach. But I think about that in even a broader picture. And I, I think a lot of people are using example of their kids, so I'll, I'll pull one out of my, my, my hat as well. I have an eight-year-old daughter, and she came home the other day, and she had a math assignment. And the math assignment was about it was great. It was a real-world math assignment about the odometer in the car. The odometer has 1,000 miles. You drive 200 miles. How many miles are on the odometer? You know, that kind of thing. Actually, I want to see examples from the cyber world. 
I want to see Jimmy has a 23 megabyte file that he has to download. And it's going to come down at a certain speed. Jimmy, figure out how long it's going to take to get that, that file off the internet and on your computer.